Okay, thank you for Joanna. And I think these nice examples she mentioned across the Europe are really inspiring and, and it was a good start for the day. So um, let me introduce, we will have our first panel, which is paving the way for knowledge valorization. And um, we'll have a moderator, Eva Kosinska-Lange, welcome. She's a director at the Polish National Center for Research and Development. So Eva, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for the introduction. And uh, indeed, this is the panel to continue the discussion about best practices. Uh, my name is Eva Kocinska-Lange, and I'm running the Brussels office of NCBR, which stands for, uh, as, as it was mentioned, National Center for Research and Development. That's the main Polish RNI funding um, agency. But my role here is, of course, uh, a bit a bit different, uh, and I'm, I'm very happy. I, I think I have a very well-coordinated uh, uh, panel. It's not, of course, thanks to me, but like, as you can see, we are also a bit of green here. <laughs> Uh, so it's it's uh, it's a positive uh, positive spirit, and it was not planned actually. Um, and uh, yeah, what what we will discuss here is is indeed some some best practices that are coming from from different different countries. As uh, I will now introduce the in a few second um, uh, speakers in more detail. I um, I think it's it's worth uh, not noting that uh, the, the transfer. Of, of research results into practice is, of course, a not new topic. It was always uh, uh, quite uh, quite challenging, and uh, a lot of the, a lot, there are a lot of different initiatives uh, in this in this field, of course, for for very long time. Some of them are successful, some of them are not exactly successful, but we are all learning from uh, from them. As as you know, you probably also represent uh, partly institutions like incubators, technology parks, uh, brokers, so those kind of those kind of initiatives. And um, I think it's quite quite important indeed to share those experiences, the bad ones and the good ones, of course, to, to inspire us and to, to learn and to advance in this uh, in this field. And the key here, I think, is to understand that uh, making this whole thing work is actually quite important because it has a direct impact on the quality of our lives. And uh, this is what what we want to achieve. We want to use. Uh, science in a way to to make our our lives um, uh, our life uh, better, and um, the guiding principles that were elaborated last uh, year, as, as mentioned by uh, by by Joanna, are indeed uh, kind of gathering what uh, what we learned so far and uh, involving all the actors in this ecosystem uh, to to even create more connections between them and to to inspire um, others. There are also quite some inspiration there for entrepreneurial skills because this is what we also have to learn. We have to actually have a, a good basis for, for, for them using those, uh, those, those skills and to cover really the all fields of research and innovation. That's also quite, uh, quite important and I think that this panel is also covering different fields of research and innovation. And, um, uh, what we will discuss now is exactly the, the examples of, of uh, uh, knowledge valorization activities on the national and regional level. And I have a uh, uh, distinguished guest here with, with, with me, a, a panelist that will guide us through, the, uh, through, this, uh, through this panel with, with some practices that they um, developed uh, their organizations. Uh, so um, uh, I will start now introducing my, uh, my panelist, so Tanya. Uh, per, um, uh, Halova Perglova, she's the uh, uh, section director at the technology agency of the Czech Republic and uh, she gained her professional experience in research innovation uh, policy investment and business development in very different positions in uh, um, uh, Czech Republic but also here in Brussels. Uh, she was working at the agency in different positions but also in Czech Invest and Czech Liaison Office for RNI here in Brussels and what's actually quite uh, important also for this panel, she was uh, uh, involved uh, very actively in preparation of the guidelines that we are now discussing during the Czech presidency last year uh, during her function at the, at the Ministry of um, Education, Youth and Sports of, of the Czech Republic. Uh, then there's Thomas um, Gatslik with, with us and he's the managing director of the Joint Technology Transfer Office of Ch Charité and Berlin Institute of, um, uh, of Health. Uh, so, uh, in, engaged in, in, in topic related with uh, with with health, and but also quite broadly uh, with biology, biochemistry, and biotechnology, as this is uh, your, your your background. Um, but also, Thomas worked in different management positions, um, including Charité, but also Helmholtz Association and Helmholtz Center for Infection Research. 
and uh, he also served as a board member of Transfer Alliance and uh, trustees of Life Science Foundation and uh, was actually quite uh, uh, quite appealing to me as well. Also the vice chairman of the board of trustees for Germany, er largest early childhood education initiative, uh, like Little Scientist Foundation. I think this is quite quite important indeed also. Uh, then we have Kiel with us, Kiel Nakan Nerfeld. He's the chief strategy advisor at Vinova uh, from Sweden. And uh, he's involved in the strategic development of the new area at Vinova, which is Ecosystems for Innovative Companies. And he's been working with technology-driven business development for more than 20 years, so quite a vast experience, a different management position. He also served as a board member and advisor to several startups, um, uh, and also as an investment director in a corporate venture capital firm and a partner in a private seat investments so really from all angles you know to cover the topic and also as far as i know you were also involved in development of the guidelines which is uh, which is uh, uh, very very uh, um yeah useful for 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 this discussion and, and uh, very needed and uh, the background uh, of you is in computer computer science um and it also resulted with creation and spin-off uh, that, that you did yourself which is also you know adding to the to the topic of course and last but not least is uh, inga volman uh, volman uh, Volman with us, and she's a business uh, developer at the Radboll University in the Netherlands, and um, she has a, a background in cognitive neuro neuroscience and um, uh, research, and also owned a company that was uh, uh, focused on sustainable innovation out of sci scientific ideas, which is uh, exactly what we want to achieve here. And she focuses now on knowledge transfer, driving forward innovative uh, projects in the domain of social sciences, humanities, and arts. And uh, it also includes uh, licensing of university uh, intellectual, intellectual property, and also some spin of creation and training of researchers on, on valorization. And she also uh, develops strategies for faculties and uh, within the institute uh, to create a positive societal impact. A bit wide introduction, but at least we are now uh, quite aware uh, um, uh, that uh, we have a very uh, um, knowledgeable panel uh, here. And um, I actually count also on the active participation from your side. So please use Slido, but of course, you in the room, you can also just raise your hand a bit later on and, and ask a question in a more traditional way. Um, uh, but without further ado, we will now start. Uh, the first uh, 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 opening statements, and we will uh, learn a bit more in detail about the practices that you uh, developed at your own organization. So we will starting with Tanya, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Eva. Thank you for this introduction. I am extremely happy that I am uh, opening this panel with a very recent experience that we are having now in the Technology Agency of the Czech Republic. And this experience is actually from the technology transfer to knowledge valorization. Uh, but to present this experience, I have to go back in the past, about seven years ago, where, when we introduced a special scheme for uh, research organizations and for their technology transfer offices. And this was quite a revolutionary scheme in the Czech Republic because we give the money to the transfer offices and we said it is up to you to select the projects of, full, uh, of proof of concept, but you have to ensure that it will have an impact on the market so that there will be some kind of technology transfer. And in order actually to build their position, we said you have to create some kind of sustainable environment, sustainable process about selecting those projects and supervising them. And for this, we forced them to establish what we called commercialization committee, which has to be composed uh, from, from external people to the research organization, so that there is no interference or political issues actually. And what we got is that we really stabilized the position of the transfer technology offices, which was not the case actually in the Czech Republic before, because those were quite uh, young units and they did not have a stable position in the research organizations, because the research organizations were very much actually turned to publications and technology transfer was something that uh, they did not really want to do. Uh, but we stabilized their, their, their role because we gave them some kind of money, so some kind of power. But we also get what we wanted. We get hard technology transfer results. 
So what we get, we got a lot of patents, a lot of licenses, but not really the impact actually afterwards on the market. So now, seven years after, we were thinking like, what can we do now to influence the system? This is our role. We are a research funding organization. So we can shape the system, we can create the environment, but what will we do? And then we had this knowledge valorization event in Prague, which actually was very, very useful because it opened the debate on the national level, how to move from technology transfer to uh, knowledge valorization. And we also had this very nice workshop with Kjell, actually, about their experience in, uh, in Sweden. And we learned a lot, and we start internal discussions in the agency, how we can implement it in our programs. And now, we will implement it in the call, which will be published in two weeks. And it is very challenging, because actually, we keep some parts, so it's still, we will still give the money to the technology transfer offices. The role of the commercialization committee will be kept. So those external people will actually contribute to the selection of the projects. But we want them to do some kind of mind shift. We do not want them to do only technology transfer. We want them to do uh, intellectual assets management, to control the knowledge that they got from the projects and to think what they can do with this knowledge, not only in terms of patents, but also in terms of impact on the society and on the environment. We know that it's not going to be easy for them. We know that it's a hard change. So uh, we actually introduce compulsory bilateral meetings and compulsory workshops where we will exchange knowledge and we will try to see what are the barriers in the research organization and in the whole system. Now we are actually at the beginning of this shift. We try to introduce it as an agency and we will see what will happen. We will, of course, assist them and we have all those codes of practice that the Commission is developing, which is very, very useful for them. And we will see. So the call will be published in two weeks and we really hope to make the change. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, uh, uh, Tanya. Yeah, this is uh, um, maybe a small step uh, when you think of, of, you know, like the process, but when you go into real work, this is quite a change that, that you, you're now undertaking. And uh, um, yeah, good, good, good luck with that as well. And it looks uh, quite promising. Okay, now let's move to Germany to Thomas and uh, Charité in Berlin. Yeah, thank you very much, Eva. Yeah, ladies and gentlemen, it's a real pleasure and honor for me to be here. And uh, I, I would like to stress the point of mindset. And uh, it's, it's, uh, you mentioned some of the points. And all my life, I'm, I'm working the academic system. So I, I would like to talk about some experience we face and some problems we still face. So all, all over, it's still a long journey we have to go. Um, uh, one important point is in innovation. Oh, we have to start. In innovation systems, uh, um, we often emphasize on structures and funding. Um, this is clearly important, as you mentioned, but it's far from being sufficient. So the real game changer is the mindset, and we should focus on this to a, a really big amount. As you can see on the right side, an innovation journey can be very, that's very simple, simplified into three phases, ideation, validation, and value creation. And each phase, of course, plays a wider role, but ideation, and that's where the mind shift, mindset comes in, is crucial in paving the path for knowledge valorization. And we need a substantial pool of um, candidates, especially in the area of, of health and life science. I guess we need about 500 to 1,000 candidates to have one asset which really gives an impact on society or economy. And so we need a large pool, and we need to shift the scientists' mindset to a stronger emphasis on valorization, and this is key to unlock our full potential. What we face very often is a, is a more or less misunderstanding of market dynamics, and in our case, the importance of intellectual property rights. And I really want to make this clear, patenting and publishing are not contradictory. You, you know this probably, but uh, it's, it, it's not known in the scientist system. And 
it, the timing is the point that matters. And for example, in drug development, without IP, there is no industry investment. And without any industry investment, there will be no product and ultimately no valor, valor, um, knowledge valorization. Furthermore, we, um, what we faced is direct financial incentive to the scientists have hardly any effect. Uh, and structural measures are important, but without a corresponding shift in mindset, there's a high risk of just investing in secondary B or C projects. And we should really invest in the best projects, not the ones coming to us. Um, cultural, oops. I'm sorry. Uh, go back. Oh, it's up, it's back. Okay. It's one more, yeah. No. I'm sorry, I'm <laughs> a little bit lost. So cultural transformation can only succeed, uh, and this is really important, if efforts in knowledge valorization are recognized and rewarded within the academic system. If this does not happen, we will have no chance to, to make an impact. And one question which comes very often is, does this approach harm science? And for me, the answer is a clear no if the alignment is right. And Two points to this. Basic research for me is the basis for groundbreaking innovation, full stop. But it is crucial to assess all scientific achievements for their potential economic or societal benefit. So it's not about doing the research, but it's about dealing with the results. And to advance this shift, knowledge valorization criteria should complement, and we do still do not do this uh, in our institute, but they should complement publication and third party funding. They should become an equal part of our scientific currency. For example, when you evaluate science results or when you do recruitment processes. And one powerful motivator is reputation for both the scientists and the institutions. And therefore, this is also important. We must emphasize knowledge valorization in our internal and external communication. Uh, we all know, and they are very common, paper of the month. Why not start an impact of the month's recognition as well? This would give reputation and maybe makes an impact on our scientific system. A cultural transformation is indeed a tough challenge. It requires both time and additional measures. Uh, with, you need this additional method, message to, to make clear that intrinsic motivation, once it's there, does not turn into demotivation. And examples from our own experience are, for example, active scouting activities. So we go out to the signs, ID consultation hours, so a low level, a low level quite easy to go uh, measure, education programs or validation programs we have implemented that combine funding, training, and also protect time. Time is dedicated for doing valorization efforts. And uh, we have two programs. One is in wet lab, uh, it's a Spark BH program, and the other one is digital, it's a digital health accelerator. Um, I think one point is also important. It's crucial to make processes easier and faster. We have to rethink technology transfer and this is also important, we have to create conflict of interest policies, especially if it comes to startups, but we have to create them in a way that they facilitate rather than hinder progress. Um, a significant opportunity for us lies in standardization and harmonization. And uh, I, I see this is also part of the campaign and I think this is really important and for me, one initiative is, is outstanding. It's the one undertaken by the Ivy League universities under the leadership of Columbia University. And this indeed could serve as a compelling model for us. Of course, it has to be adapted to European, European circumstances, but this could be done by some organization. The European Union is one. I also see in the area of uh, life sciences and uh, medicine, the European University Hospital Alliance, and on a broader level, uh, the ASTP, which is also here. And to, to conclude, um, 
it's less about structures and framework. It's more about fostering the right mindset and providing the necessary recognition and support by the academic system. And I'm deeply convinced that in this way we can foster very much the impact of research and society uh, and economy. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thomas. Um, and indeed, that's the most challenging uh, part of, of the whole change that we have to go to mindset. And this takes time and we need, need of different incentives. And uh, as uh, you are completely right, money uh, doesn't really, don't really work that much. Yeah. Okay, so now let's go to Sweden and to Kiel. And uh, the floor is yours. I think you have to use the same mic. Yeah? Yes. Uh, thank you. And thank you for the introduction. And good morning, everybody. And thanks for inviting me here. I want to share with, me, with you today one contribution that we have done for knowledge valorization. And that is uh, through the IP vouchers. IP vouchers is addressing one of the more important cornerstones of the new uh, knowledge valorization guidelines, namely management of intellectual assets. So that's what I will be talking about today. Uh, that was backwards. This is forward. <laughs> Same problem. Yeah, it should be on the you know re left and right. Uh, the objective of, of, uh, of the IP voucher scheme, and that's a con uh, this is a collaboration between Vinova and the Swedish Patent Office, was to move focus from protection of inventions really to value creation and the management of intellectual assets. I'm very puzzled that everybody's talking over in Europe about protection and protection. Like everybody's believing that you make money in courts. I think you make money by, by creating compelling competitive value for customers, paying the bills and the, the invoices. So, so why is that the protection so important? I think we should move that, and that's what we wanted to do with SMEs. In the same way, we wanted to improve their competencies, their ways of working, their networks that supported what I would call capturing, claiming, and controlling intellectual assets. We also saw that among the advisors and the coaches, this competence on intellectual asset management was very low, so we wanted to improve their ability also to support companies. The design we made was that we got an IP voucher, which is a grant of 100,000 Swedish kronor, uh, to buy external expertise to help companies develop their uh, uh, IP strategies around intellectual assets. And, and the in, in innovation, invention that we made or innovation was that we were not ap getting applications from SMEs. We used business advisors that had normal contact with companies to really reach out to the companies, keep the dialogue with them and assess their needs of, of uh, uh, this and to really create the project or, or the strategy project uh, that they should conduct uh, in the SMEs. But we also saw that since the level of competence was so low, we stipulated the process. So every, every voucher had to go three steps. They had to work with an inventory, uh, looking into what kind of assets do a company have. The second was <clears throat> to understand its competitive position in the IP landscape. And based on those two things, uh, you develop a strategy. So do, you don't get into, a, the most people wanted to do patent strategies, but they had to force go through these steps. And, and, uh, and uh, the voucher scheme is then complemented by a lot of uh, you know, awareness raising campaigns, uh, training, and even though the uh, advisors that were supposed to uh, work with those IP vouchers, they had to go to a training before they could uh, 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 su supply them or, or to companies. Oh, it was too fast. Oh, it's, this is really sensitive. Now, yes. Uh, the challenges that we have been seeing in, in doing this is that it's really difficult to move. Uh, uh, it's so deeply rooted, this protection thing. So, so that has been an, an, uh, an interesting journey. And, and uh, I always get in, we have been running this for many years, and they always come back to me, the business advisor, and say, no companies are, are asking for IP vouchers. That's clear. Nobody will ask for IP vouchers. They, they work, they have problems with the margin in, 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 with their products. They have problems with border uh, trade or whatever. You have to start where they are in, in their own problems and then 
have a dialogue with them in order to, uh, to really understand what kind of challenges they have around assets. Because they won't get an, you won't get an application for an IP voucher. But this has been also very challenging because when I look into the business advisors and their ability to create and have these dialogues with companies, it's, they don't have that kind of competence. So that need, you need training in, in creating how do, you cre how do you make a dialogue with a company in order to get into these kind of challenges that they have around value creation based on intellectual assets. And let me close by give you some statistics. I haven't from the last four years, but this is from the, uh, between, two, we introduced them 2016. And you can see that always it's difficult to get to them and get to their, uh, their challenges. But when they learn about this, it's a hallelujah moment for them. They realize this is really, really important and really creates new ways of, of being more competitive, being more attractive, creating more value. Uh, and and uh, so, so you can see that uh, really promising kind of, of, of statements from, uh, from the companies. But it's difficult. Thank you, Kiel. Thank you. And uh, yeah, I think it's a nice bridge between what you said and what you said uh, that it's still a bit of mindset change that we have to do. Yeah, like uh, you were talking about researchers, you were talking about companies, but uh, it's still a bit uh, uh, coming down to, uh, to to this, or not like n not patenting for the sake of patenting only, but to think what you can do with this patent actually afterwards. That's quite crucial, and you have to realize that there's more that you can do uh, than just, uh, I don't know, get some points or, or, or um, appreciation for the, for the fact that you got a patent. Okay, and uh, we are now moving to the Netherlands, uh, to uh, Inga, the floor is yours. Thank you, Eva. Um, yeah, so I actually want to start, which is, fits nicely with what you just said, is um, I work for the Rappert University, and um, here I have put up the mission of our university. So the university really stands for that they want to contribute to a healthy and free world with equal opportunities for all. And uh, they want to make a significant impact in all their domains that they work in. And this also translates to us as I work in a knowledge transfer office. Um, we call it knowledge transfer office. Basically, it's, it's a tech transfer office, uh, but we have an impact first approach. So uh, our approach is not a priori making money, we want to create more impact. Um, of course, we need to follow the law, so we will uh, uh, price our IP for licensing and for collaborations in a market conform way. Uh, but, and, and we will make sure that our spin-offs are sustainable and everything, of course, but on top of that, we really work around the creation of social value. That's, that is our main goal. And that also translates actually in everything that we do. So um, this goes in the range of um, making sure that uh, there are funding opportunities for projects around societal impact to promote researchers that are about this impact creation. We have an incubator that focuses on this entrepreneurial mindset and building skill sets. And also what Eva already mentioned, we work within the university to uh, help uh, institutes and the university itself around, around their impact strategy as well to, to really ingrain this. And today I want to show you two examples uh, of this. Um, the first one is around um, how this approach already uh, creates uh, spin-offs that have a significant impact on uh, social value. Uh, oops, this also went too fast. So um, the spin-off I wanted to focus on is called Social Shuffle. So it's built on a product that um, has been on the market for a couple of years, but the company itself started in September. Uh, the product is really about uh, improving the social climate in classrooms, in primary and secondary schools. And uh, while well, the company just started, but is already uh, sustainable for the coming years, uh, financially sustainable, uh, but on top of that, what I think is really nice, what maybe you just quickly saw, is that it's already used by 18,000 teachers. Um, and this means that actually children in 18,000 classrooms benefit from this improved social climate. And, um, well, as uh, it's been shown by research that uh, if children are in a classroom with more positive social interactions, a positive social climate, this also improves their motivation, their health, their social well-being. Uh, well 
And for example, if you already look at uh, numbers around bullying, um, um, it has been calculated that per child, bullying leads to a cost of 1.4 million euros during their lifetime. Uh, so this is just to give an example of, um, of a spin-off that came out of our university recently where you already have this social value creation ingrained and what you gain by that, not only for the children, but actually also money-wise for society. Um, the final thing I want to talk about is a bit more, maybe a bit more boring, people might find it, but I actually think it's really critical. Uh, so we, our university is quite broad, so we have different faculties which all operate in a different way. Um, and this also meant that the knowledge transfer processes were really different. Um, by them being dif different, that also led to a lot of um, slowing down of the process, a lot of frustration with researchers who actually wanted to engage within knowledge transfer. Um, and also a lot of unclarity of how the processes were built. So um, what my colleagues did is actually they created a work group where each faculty was presented, so natural science, but also social science, humanities, because in all of these faculties, uh, knowledge transfer happens and uh, intellectual assets are present. And uh, what came out was a uniform process across the whole university um, so that every faculty now uses the same process around knowledge transfer. And what also came out is that we now work around impact teams. And that, that actually means that uh, if a new pro project comes up around knowledge transfer, we have a, a valorization employee from the faculty involved that knows the, uh, the topic and knows the researcher. We have a knowledge transfer professional from the central level where I work at the knowledge transfer office involved because they know most about intellectual assets, intellectual property and, and the management of that. And we have a lawyer involved. And we already have that from the beginning of the project so that they all know we work on this project. Uh, and also the researcher knows that they can contact those people. And it's, we've only been doing it for a couple of months now and I already see that it really speed things up. And, um, makes it easier and reduces also frustration with researchers, which in the end will make, sh make sure that more people will engage in it. And we're closing this whole process off, but now with an awareness campaign within the university um, where um, we communicate basically all these different, this different knowledge and make it easy, accessible for the researchers. So thank you. Thanks a lot, Inge, and it is actually quite important always also to underline that uh, knowledge valorization is not only for the uh, no kind of physics or engineering or uh, natural sciences and so on, but that's also quite important for social sciences. And it might be actually sometimes even maybe easier uh, to get to, to the societal impact because this is the nature of the, of, of the sciences and it's quite, quite important what this startup is also doing. So uh, I think we are quite inspired, at least I am. Uh, but so what we what, what we what we had, uh, we have uh, something like ten minutes uh, still for for some uh, questions and answer session. And I of course open the floor to all of you and also to Slido. I hope I will see Slido in a, in a sec as well. Uh, but if you have a, a question, uh, just raise your raise your hand. Otherwise, I will also, of course, come up with some questions that I, I have. But since we have only 10 minutes, I think it will be quite uh, good to also get into interaction with the audience. And we have a question from the room. Uh, so, yeah, the mic, probably. Not yet. It works. Yes, yeah. now it works. Please introduce yourself. And if you have the person to ask the question also directly. Yeah, hello, I'm uh, Andreas Westermund from the University in Bergen, Norway. So I work with um, health and medical research. Uh, I'm a contact point towards the TTO. So uh, I agree with everything said by everyone. But in reality, there is also this, uh, I think, this misalignment of motivation that our TTOs, the, the, their KPIs are very tied to commercialization. So these non-commercial projects like the, the social scuffle, they are not really rewarded uh, and therefore they are more difficult to fund from, from the TTO side. Uh, at the same time, our researcher KPI is, you know, at least until now, based on publication. So business development is like a distraction on your CV. 
And of course, uh, you know, in, in, in Norway, unlike Sweden, we have the institutional development. So, so this uh, whole the, the transfer from a, a project to the SME is, is less clear. Um, so, so I think Thomas said we need to, to recognize and reward, uh, but how do we solve that? So my question is, is this the responsibility of the national funding uh, bodies alone? Or can we somehow drive the change from EU and specifically can we change how we evaluate researcher CVs in, in uh, all the pillars and, and reward uh, yeah, this type of uh, work more. Yeah. Okay, th thank you for this question. So um, concerning the responsible, I think it's both as national and uh, to the institutes. For the institutes, um, use it for um, uh, recruiting processes and also uh, most universities have internal uh, incentives and uh, HRT is still publication and third party money and we should bring a third element in. And uh, it also could help that uh, the CEO of our, of our institutes use successes in knowledge valorization uh, to tell the scientific community, for example, in receptions and so on. So it's, it's, it's very necessary to convince the leadership. And um, on a national level, I think that's, that's a very cost-effective mechanism, and UK did this. Um, One-third of scientific evaluation is dedicated to impact orientation. And so, well, it's, um, and the institutes are quite free uh, what they do. And so, uh, if the national bodies ask the research institutes, okay, that's nice, your numbers on publication and third-party money, what's the impact you got? In this moment, um, the system changes because everyone has to think about this. And everyone notice, okay, this year was not so good in publications, but from my institute came th uh, three startups out. You can um, put this together and say, hey, this was also a great success. And if, if this is recognized, it is a success. And then it also will change the system. I want to make two concrete things. One thing, remove uh, patent as a research output that's going into the ditch. So that's first thing. Don't count patents as a research output. The second one is that to change mindset, uh, one thing that you might add to everybody's talking about the impact, but you should ask all the researchers and they should be in, uh, convinced to think about what what do you believe in? What are the hypotheses uh, on, on if you succeed with a research result? How will that change the industry or society? What hypotheses do you have? Uh, and, and then when and how do you well validate those hypotheses? So you get into this mindset of, of, of understanding that you make some sort of assumptions about your research or start thinking about how you should be successful and then validate those kind during the research and afterwards. Because that would change more into an, I would say, scientific discovery has to be complemented by entrepreneurial discovery. And, and uh, uh, like in US, it has shown that if you are a researcher with and understand entrepreneurial discovery, you become much more better as a researcher. Okay. But I just have to say this, that uh, it sounds to me like we need leaders that are able to do a patent re revolution here. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, uh, Inga was also first, but I will... Yeah, just I will keep it really brief. Um, in the Netherlands, there's an initiative ongoing now from a, a, a national initiative from our government called Recognition and Reward. So that sort of, and uh, that is a push from national to all the universities that they need to come up with an approach to work around recognition and reward, not only around impact, but also education uh, on all the aspects of all the different pillars. And um, this has already led with some universities to different profiles that researchers, researchers can have and then different evaluations that they have. Okay, that was my brief. If I can add from the perspective of a funding organization, we definitely can shape the environment because what we measure, uh, that's what we get finally. So, <laughs> so if we measure, not patents and things like this, but if we measure the system, how they think about the system, which is much more difficult 
also difficult for us. So we must also make this mind shift uh, in the agency. And it's not an easy task neither. So, uh, but what we measure, that's what we get. So I think that we definitely have a role to play. Yes, thank you. There was another question, I think, yeah? No, okay. Uh, hi, Henrik Rudin, Volvo Cars, so I'm industry, but I used to work for Gothenburg University Institute of Medicine and also worked for Technology University in tech transfer, so I kind of have both aspects. Are we really funding the right research? Isn't that the key question? And in particular, when it comes to climate change, we really need to start facing that we are in a hurry. We need to do things challenge-based and now. And it's not a research question. It's research all the way to implementation. So uh, you at the end from Holland, sorry, I forgot your name. You said we obey the rules. Yes, but here the rule shouldn't be a matter. It's about solving a true challenge for society. And the government is a part of that. And industry needs to be a part of that because the two actors that has the capital is the government and the industry. And we have to start collaborating. And university needs to be a part of this because they have a lot of things to actually add to this equation. So like take COVID. Uh, we have a scientific council in Sweden. They uh, essentially uh, is base research funding agency. And for the first time in history, they said, okay, you ask for this money for this type of research, but shift it to COVID. That has never happened in Sweden ever before because it was a crisis. And now we have the climate crisis. So money shouldn't be an issue. We shouldn't have calls. We should be the best, cleverest people in the nation that should solve the problem. And the government should just make sure that the funding is there. Challenge-based research and implementation. I think it was more like a comment uh, than, than a question. And uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, we run out of time. <laughs> but uh, of course, I will allow for some immediate interactions as well. I just wanted to say that, um, yeah, this is actually a very good moment for the, such a call because we are about to start planning also the future of the funding programs, uh, including the next Horizon Europe, let's say, FP10. So this involvement of all actors of, you know, how we do it and uh, how we secure that everybody is on board, it's, it's quite, quite important. So is anybody willing to add some? Yeah. I can give a small addition. Uh, I agree, definitely. And I think it's happening as well. Uh, what I wanted to stress is don't forget social sciences and humanities in this because uh, it's really important to make the te technological uh, developments that are happening, to make them fit actually with society. So society will pick it up and will use it. That was my uh, addition. I also agree, but uh, as always, you have to be cautious. When you talk about researchers, it's, uh, everybody's claiming that uh, they, they come to Einstein and say, well, look what he made. And, uh, and I usually ask them, should every person be an Einstein? What kind of world would we then have? Uh, so so there's, there's always this mix about different things that are needed. So we don't kill basic science, we don't kill apply, we don't kill user. But of course, it should be driven by, by, uh, by common uh, kind of directionality. And also, I believe that the value creation as a core cre requires collaboration because you cannot create a value in a, in a, in a silo, uh, which, for example, look at uh, the, the history of uh, Stanford Research Institute, which was almost going bankrupt because they didn't have value creation as a foundation for research. Mas really wants to answer one question, but I think we really have to finish as well. So, kind of, let's let me from Slido. Okay, for, uh, to the to the one how how to assess societal impact. I think that's a good example where we can establish a European standard, because I think the criteria are still open. But it would be good to start not on a national or institutional level, but on a European standard. And if we go together and discuss and define the the, the impact criteria, I think that would be a great thing. 
Thank you all uh, so much for, for your active uh, uh, part participation and uh, the examples and comments that, that you gave, but also to the audience for, uh, for, the, for the engagement. And uh, I think it's time to, to close this uh, part and, uh, and continue the discussion during the coffee break. Uh,